Welcome to ID the Future, a podcast about intelligent design and evolution. Greetings and welcome to the ID the Future podcast. This is Casey Luskin, broadcasting from Seattle, Washington. And we have a very special guest on our show with us today, Professor Philip Johnson, who anyone who is familiar with the intelligent design movement, he needs no introduction. Professor Johnson is a professor of law, emeritus at Bolt Hall School of Law. He got his undergraduate degree at Harvard and his law degree from the University of Chicago, uh, was a Supreme Court clerk, and is very well known in the intelligence design movement as really being one of the inspirations behind the movement for his works and his, uh, his books on Darwinian evolution, showing that uh, Darwinian evolution is not a theory that is beyond scientific critique, but is quite open to scientific critique. So, Professor Johnson, it's a real honor to have you on our show with us today. Thank you. Nice well, to be with I, you, Casey. Well, we have you on the phone from California right now, and we wanted to speak with you, Professor Johnson, because you were recently interviewed, or within the last few months, were interviewed by PBS and Nova for their upcoming PBS Nova Judgment Day Intelligent Design documentary on the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial. And it turns out that you, I believe, are one of the few ID proponents that ended up being interviewed for the documentary, and I'd like to talk to you about both the documentary and some of the publicity that PBS has been doing for the documentary, and also get your thoughts a little bit about the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial. So maybe we could start with that. I'd be curious for our listeners to be able to hear, what is your opinion of the Kitzmiller ruling overall? Well, the judge decided to uh, uh, strike out for fame, and he got it. He, he became a hero to the uh, scientific materialist world and the, uh, the official scientific uh, organs and to uh, publications like Time Magazine that named him as one of the most significant intellectuals in the world. But it's just a, a rant, really, the, the opinion by a judge who didn't want to stick to just making a ruling in the case, but wanted to make himself a big player in the national scene and arguing about uh, evolution and the resulting controversies. Now, obviously, one of the biggest criticisms of the Kitzmiller ruling is that it goes too far in trying to do things like defining science or even deciding some very, you might call the minutia of the debate over intelligent design, like whether or not the type 3 secretory system could have been an intermediate to evolve the bacterial flagellum and these sorts of things. Um, yes, he went way share... beyond uh, his proper role as a a trial court judge uh, issuing a ruling in a case and decided to write a book about the general subject of evolution and so on. Of course, it's a ghost-written book because much of uh, what he uh, wrote was taken verbatim from the uh, American Civil Liberties Union brief. Is that something that you would call typical for judges to borrow so heavily in key sections from one of the party's briefs? It's uh, uh, typical enough for uh, probably for judges to borrow a little from a brief if they agree with it. Uh, it's the extent of the borrowing and the degree to which it was beyond the judicial function to uh, to go so far into the uh, details of the dispute. And uh, one thing I, is uh, that that you mentioned specifically, Casey, that's amusing is it's that defining of science. Now, scientists and philosophers of science have never been able to come up with a satisfactory <laughs> definition of science. The Supreme Court has never been able to come up with a satisfactory di division of religion. But this judge thinks, he, he seems to think he knows all about these subjects and uh, could just off the top of his head issue rulings settling all these very difficult issues. So if you were the judge presiding over the Kitzmiller case, how would you have decided it? Well, I probably would have said as little as possible. In fact, once the judge had said it was a religiously motivated, he didn't need to say anything more. He did say that. Now, whether motivation is really uh, crucial or not is a, is a question uh, that could be debated, but the judge was applying a doctrine from the Supreme Court that makes religious motivation decisive, and he, he found that there was a religious motivation. He had material in the record to justify that finding. Yes. There was no need to go further, and I think it's just a question of ambition and desire for the spotlight. So you would say that Judge Jones was looking to influence more people's opinions than settling, than yes. really settling the case that was before him. <laughs> he wasn't just deciding the case before it. He was entering into this uh, debate. I, I don't know whether his uh, primary desire was to influence people's opinion or to make a name for himself. 
Now, let's switch over to the PBS Nova Project, because obviously this Judgment Day Intelligent Design documentary is uh, entirely about the Kitzmiller versus Dover case. And I'd like to find out a little about the interview that you actually went through. But first off, how did you get involved with the PBS Nova Project? Well, I uh, wonder whether it was a good idea. It might have been wiser on my part to have stayed away from it. I wasn't told that it was a program about the Kitzmiller versus Dover case. The uh, producer who phoned me it said that they had uh, they were going to uh, ask something about that, but I thought that the uh, program was mainly about the nature of the intelligent design movement, and I thought that was uh, something that uh, I could contribute something to, and I was glad to see that subject on uh, the NOVA program. So it's something of a, a shock to me to find out that the sole focus of the program is the Kitzmiller case. Very interesting. If they told, so, uh, but presented it to me that way, I don't think I would have participated. Is that right? Now, why why would you not participate if it was about the Kitzmiller case? Well, I had nothing to do with the Kitzmiller case uh, uh. and don't feel that, uh, that that was something I was really interested in participating in. And I also feel that that's a subject on which I would expect nothing but propaganda. Ah, okay. Uh, and so uh, I would be suspicious of. Now, I don't mind. I, I, I'm quite sure that the program will be the, the party line of the scientific establishment about this issue, but there's nothing I can do about that if that's what they're going to do. I'm just hoping that there isn't some unfair editing of my my own part. Well, this is a good lead into my next question, actually. Did you feel that when they conducted the interview that it was fair? Did you get any... Oh, yes. The the people who conducted the interview, the uh, the camera people and the producer who asked questions uh, were fine, and I had a very good discussion with them. But that, that's just the thing that is, is, is worrisome. One of the things that happens with these television uh, setups is that they send out a perfectly reasonable uh, interviewer and uh, film crew, and they, then they hope to uh, get the subject uh, speaking uh, unguardedly, and then the, the real damage is done back in the editing room when they look to pick out something that will serve uh, their purpose and discredit the subject. So that's what I'm worried about. Is the, uh, what, what goes on in the editing room. As if it was just a matter of the uh, filming crew that came out to talk to me, uh, I would feel fine about it. And I think that our the general understanding is that you were perhaps the only leading ID proponent that was interviewed for this documentary. So what does that do for your blood pressure when you think about what might happen with this uh, documentary? So I say I'm not particularly worried about the documentary itself. They're go- if they're going to put on, on a documentary that takes the party line, then they're, that's what they're going to do, and I can't do anything uh, to stop that, nor, nor would I. They, they can put out the point of view that they want to, and I, I, I'm just uh, a little worried that I, I got involved in uh, uh, talking with them, and I don't know what's going to happen on, with the editing at WGBH in Boston. I have been lucky in the past. I've almost had a charmed life of interviews that things could have turned out badly, and I I, I could have been misquoted or uh, edited in an unfair way, but this has not been my experience, so I'm hoping it won't be my experience this time. If they just put on me on saying what I said, then no matter what the overall slant of the program is, I can't complain. So as far as the slant goes, are you anticipating that this will be biased in a certain direction? It sounds, sounds like you are. I think that the uh, uh, NOVA people and the WGVH people would uh, catch a lot of uh, criticism and be given a lot of grief by their uh, their friends in the uh, scientific establishment if they did not come out with a slanted documentary that was slanted towards the official uh, scientific establishment party line. Now, there's one other item I'd like to ask you about, Professor Johnson, because we can get a little bit of a sneak preview as to what this documentary is going to be about because they have actually been sending out briefing packets to teachers, my understanding teachers all around the country in public schools regarding how to deal with teaching evolution in schools. And it's a very one-sided briefing packet. I've read through it and it very much promotes the view that intelligent design is a religious view, that it's not science and so forth. And of course, as you said, you know, this is the party line and this is not too unexpected for them to be taking the party line. What was concerning was when they recommended in the teacher's guide that teachers basically inject religion into the science classroom by discussing 
religious denominations that accept evolution. And I, I'd like to just read a brief excerpt from the briefing packet to you, Professor Johnson, and get your reaction to it for our listeners. The question asks, can you accept evolution and still believe in religion? And the answer goes on to say, in part, yes, the common view that evolution is inherently anti-religious is simply false. And then later on, it goes on to give various examples of religious denominations that accept evolution. And of course, there's no mention of any religious views that might be skeptical of evolution in this briefing packet. So I guess my question for you is, of course, uh, these people are entitled to whatever view they want as far as whether religion conflicts with evolution. And of, and of course, many religious people find no conflict with evolution. But when they are recommending that public school teachers teach this sort of a view in the, uh, in the science classroom, for instance, does that raise any legal troubles in your mind? Well, it raises uh, legal trouble if you want to see them. The, uh, the problem is that uh, some of our federal uh, uh, judges, like, uh, like Judge Jones in this program, have decided to take on a role of protecting the science establishment from criticism of their most sacred doctrine. And so they don't want to see any legal problems, and they, they won't. One, one thing that one sees in this kind of an approach is that when you teach uh, evolution in the uh, schools, you, you are bringing religious issues into the classroom uh, because when, when you're talking about how uh, all the forms of life came into existence or got created, that is a, a religious issue. And if you say it was by unintelligent material forces only, and uh, God had nothing to do with it, which is the party line in the evolutionary science world, that is their uh, uh, consistent uh, position. The, the fact that uh, they're putting out a pamphlet with a, a, a statement like that is, it just illustrates that when you're teaching uh, uh, evolution in the public schools and you're teaching Darwinian evolution and the official line of the evolutionary science uh, community, you're teaching religious questions. You're getting into those, and then you have to sort out good religion from bad religion, which is what they're doing. They want to talk about the denomination that accept the evolutionary story that they're saying. That's good religion. That's the, 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 the clear implication of what they're saying. So <laughs> sure. there could involve a, a, a legal issue, I would think, yes, if you want to see it. If you get, try to get that in front of Judge Jones and get him to see the legal issue, he's not going to see it because he doesn't want well, to see it. And, of course, the briefing packet is actually following Judge Jones's approach quite closely. Judge Jones ruled that it was yes. quote, utterly false, unquote, to say that religion conflicts with evolution and so forth. So, uh, Legal question or not, that's very misleading language. That's why I object to it mainly, is it's misleading. What would be more accurate to say is that there is a dispute about whether uh, the theory of evolution implies the non-existence of God as a creator. It's a matter that's in dispute, not something that is obviously settled the way that Judge Jones and the scientific establishment have de decided that it ought to be settled. And, and, and in fact, one of the phenomenon that's in the news today is that there is a, a big surge, just as we have a surge in, of troops in Iraq, there is a surge of scientific atheism in the scientific community. It is headed by Richard Dawkins, the Oxford professor who is the world's most prominent promoter of Darwinism and also the world's most prominent promoter of atheism. Now, yes. if you ask Dawkins whether the uh, Darwinian theory implies uh, atheism, he's not going to answer no. He's not going to answer like uh, Judge Jones and the, and the uh, pamphlet you're quoting uh, answered. So uh, it's no coincidence that the world's most prominent Darwinist is also the world's most prominent promoter of atheism. Now, th it's true that there are other people who, who take a different implication from Darwinism. People like Francis Collins, the head of the U.S. government's uh, Human Genome Project. Collins is a, an outspoken evangelical Christian who says there's no conflict between uh, Darwinian evolution and his sure. religion. But Collins, Collins is much publicized for this view. But when I, you read a news story about uh, Collins or an, uh, a review of his book, it'll, it'll generally point out how remarkable a thing it is that Collins doesn't see a conflict between his, uh, <laughs> the scientific theory he's endorsing and uh, his religious position. He's ah. an exception. He's a remarkable person. So it's in dispute. It isn't clear. It, it, isn't, that, uh, there isn't, it, it isn't that everybody agrees that Darwinism does lead to atheism, 
or, or that it doesn't. There's a dispute about that matter. That makes it an important religious question. An accurate statement would be telling the students that the connection between Darwinism and atheism is in dispute. Not that it's okay. been settled that there's no connection. So this is very typical that information is put out from the Darwinian establishment and its allies that is very seriously misleading. And then this is uh, uh, presented as uh, absolute truth to the, the students in the schools with uh, uh, that, that official endorsement. So the students are being taught very misleading uh, information, even outright lies. What's going on here is a process of soothing. The, the scientific establishment has decided that the way to get a reluctant American public to uh, put aside their doubts and believe what they're being told in the mass media and the textbooks and the museums about evolution is absolutely true, uh, is to reassure them. It, it doesn't threaten your religion. Then after they have been uh, talked into accepting the theory, then the the, the, the types like Richard Dawkins will come out and say, well, actually, now that you've accepted it, we have to tell you that it does destroy your religion. <laughs> That's the, the one-two punch. First, you uh, soothe them into accepting something, and then you give them the, uh, hit them with the other shoe. These kinds of uh, p uh, statements and materials that come out cannot be trusted. They are not honest. They, uh, they uh, attempt to give a very one-sided and hence a misleading description of the situation. Many parents understand this, and this is why they're, they're so upset with what the schools are doing. The, these things get into the media. Reporters will ask the official scientific organizations uh, for what they should print about it, and they'll say, oh, these people are religious fanatics who are completely unreasonable because they're seeing something we don't want them to see. And all of this raises a question that I would be very interested in your answer in, Professor Johnson, because, I mean, you follow this debate for many years. You're aware that for decades, the scientific community has been issuing statements to the effect of science and religion do not conflict. They may even say they're totally separate spheres. Uh, they can't even conflict in principle. And yet public skepticism of evolution remains very high. What does this say to you? Is there more? I mean, why are these attempts to, as you put it, soothe religious people regarding evolution? It really seems like they're failing. At least the public that is largely religious is still. Very skeptical. Yeah, so they still are very skeptical, and they they don't believe the reassurances. They know that's not what's going on. The fact is, the public is not as stupid as the experts uh, wish them to be. And do you think also that there are scientific doubts that the public has that are not being? Sued yes, there are. There are scientific doubts that the public knows that the the theory of evolution can be demonstrated or tested by experiment only at a relatively trivial level. When you ask the uh, evolutionary scientists to come up with a example of how their theory has been demonstrated, they'll always come back to the same examples of things like insect populations becoming resistant to insecticides. They don't have any examples of insects changing into something fundamentally different, uh, as they would have to be able to do if the theory is, is true in, the, in, the, in a general way. So uh, the situation that the public realizes is that evolution can be demonstrated or tested scientifically only at the trivial level of what's often called microevolution. Microevolution isn't really evolution at all. A better term for it would be adaptive variation. You do see some uh, minor changes going on in populations or species. You do not see one kind of uh, a plant or animal evolving into something fundamentally different. The public knows this. They know something is being sold to them that's kind of like, like the way used cars are sometimes sold. Well, Professor Philip Johnson, we're running out of time here, and it has been wonderful to have you on our show. This has been very enlightening. Thank you so much for sharing your insights into this issue with us today. This is Casey Luskin with the ID of the Future podcast signing off. Thanks for listening. Music on ID of the Future comes courtesy of composer Yuri Momchur. Visit www.yuriproductions.com and check out his latest CD, In the Harbor. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. Discovery President is Bruce Chapman. ID the Future Managing Editor is Robert Crowther. And the producer is Keith Bennett. ID the Future and ID Science in the News is copyright Discovery Institute 2006. For more information, visit www.discovery.org or www.idthefuture.com.